Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the first Digital Leadership Series event of 2022. I couldn't be more delighted that all of you are here with us today once again. Uh, it's, you know, I was looking at the registration list um, before I signed on today, and it's just so nice to see so many of our old friends, uh, students, alumni, uh, all attending today, and of course, uh, members of our community. So welcome to one and all, and a belated Happy New Year to all of you. Um, before I get started, I wanted to uh, acknowledge our sponsors, KPMG and Kalpana Ramakrishnan in particular, who has been supporting our center and serves on our advisory board, and the Beale Family Foundation. I believe Don Beale himself may be attending tonight, so thank you, Don. Thank you, Kalpana. Uh, you make it possible for our audience to attend at no cost, and we remain very grateful for your support of what you do for the university and the center. Thank you again. Uh, with that, let me introduce uh, some of the themes for today. We're featuring Martin Ford, uh, who is a best-selling author. He wrote the book, Rise of the Robots, which won uh, the McKinsey Award uh, and the, the Financial Times slash McKinsey Best Business Book of the Year a few years ago. And now he's followed up with a book called Rule of the Robots, which of course reflects the fact that artificial intelligence has become so much important in the few short years since his previous book. One of the things I did want to mention was uh, one of the other things he wrote in between was this book called Architects of Intelligence, which I actually have all three of these books. And, and it's a fascinating book because he interviewed the movers and shakers of artificial intelligence, the people who are actually building the algorithms, building the systems. And so Martin has perhaps uh, 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 one of the best perches in Silicon Valley to, to, to analyze what is happening in the artificial intelligence industry, what the impacts are for good and for, for unfortunately, sometimes not so good, uh, and can give us a, a view of sort of where, we, where this is all going. So the book is Rule of the Robots, How Artificial Intelligence Will Transform Everything. Uh, so welcome, Martin. But before I turn it over to you, just one housekeeping note, which is uh, we will be taking questions in the Q&A section. The chat section is closed. So without further ado, thank you so much for joining us this evening, Martin. We're just really, really delighted to host you and really looking forward to what you have to share with us tonight. Take it away. Thank you. It's, it's really great to be here. And uh, thank you all for, for coming. Um, I have been uh, focused on the implications of artificial intelligence and robotics for you know well over a decade now. I've written a total of four books on this subject. And you know, having really studied this, I've really come around to the view that we are very likely on the verge of, of a very significant disruption. And I think um, it's a disruption that potentially is gonna be transformative on the scale of a new industrial revolution. I think we're beginning to see the early stages of this now. Um, I also think that clearly this is a disruption that's gonna have two sides to it. Um, it is going to bring enormous benefits uh, really to all of humanity. It's gonna, I think, uh, give a major boost to science, to medicine, uh, to scientific innovation. It's gonna help us solve um, some of the biggest problems that we face. But at the same time, uh, the rise of, of AI is going to bring with it some real risks and some real dangers that we're gonna have to um, be very much aware of. So I think our task going forward is gonna be to embrace this technology, but at the same time, be very much aware of the dangers that comes with it and, and, and adapt to those. Uh, so what I wanna do is just briefly go over some of the main topics in my, my recent book, Rule of the Robots. Um, and then we will you know, move to a discussion and we can perhaps uh, talk about things in more detail. So first of all, what, uh, is artificial intelligence really all about? And I would argue that th the thing that makes it unique is that we are really, for the first time, bringing cognitive capability to machines. We're building machines that in a, in a limited sense, at least, can think. And in a practical sense, AI today is really all about machine learning. And essentially what that means is building smart algorithms that can churn through uh, massive amounts of data. And based on that data, they can learn, they can figure out how to do things, how to predict things, how to uh, gain insights. And all of this is, is really what is um, leading to the revolution all around us. And to some extent, it really 
represents kind of a paradigm shift in, in the, our approach to software. You know, previously software has been something that uh, programmers, you know, software developers have had to instruct basically step by step, you know, and teaching an algorithm what to do. Uh, machine learning essentially turns that on its head and instead you unleash an algorithm, a, a learning algorithm with lots of data and it by itself figures out what to do or, or how to uh, solve various problems. So it's in a sense migrating um, the intelligence, the, the, the direction from the programmer to the software itself. And I think that this is really an important shift in, in the way we approach things. Uh, the second thing that I think is critical, and this is something that I really emphasize throughout the book, it's really a main theme of Rule of the Robots, is that I think artificial intelligence is becoming a genuine, uh, a, a general purpose technology, a systemic technology. In some ways, it's evolving into something that is really like a utility, almost elect electricity, in the sense that it is becoming ubiquitous. It's going to be everywhere. It's going to touch virtually every aspect of our lives, every sector of the economy, every industry, literally every business, every organization, um, all of these are gonna be massively impacted by artificial intelligence and it is rapidly becoming uh, a resource that's I think going to be, you know, not just everywhere, but is also indispensable in the same way that electricity is. Um, you can imagine what your life would be like even for just one day if you didn't have access to electricity. I mean, how many things in your daily life uh, relies on access to electricity? And the same is eventually becoming true of artificial intelligence. So it's got a massive, very broad-based impact. Now, one of the things that, that's really driving this evolution of, of AI into a utility is the fact that it's been incorporated into cloud computing. I mean, cloud computing is itself becoming ubiquitous. Virtually every organization of any size um, utilizes uh, co cloud computing resources, primarily from one of the three major providers. And AI is being built directly into cloud computing offerings from these large, extremely you know, influential, uh, deep-pocketed organizations like Google and Amazon and Microsoft. And as it turns out, of course, it's no coincidence that these large companies um, are also, of course, the leading um, innovators in AI. You know, these are you know, companies like Google and Microsoft are the companies that are, for the most part, the driving forces in, in you know, causing AI to advance. Uh, the key technology that's really underlying the revolution that we see all around us is deep learning um, or deep neural networks. Uh, this is the use of artificial neural networks um, in order to you know, produce machine learning systems. And this is an idea that has actually been around for a long time. The first neural networks were developed in the late 1940s. But Roughly over the last decade or so, we've seen a real revolution in this technology. It's, it's, it's probably fair to say that the last decade has been probably the most consequential period in the field of artificial intelligence in terms of the explosion of, of real world applications that we've seen. Um, and we are literally seeing things all around us that just a short time ago we would have considered to be um, science fiction, really. We see, for example, Google's language translation that is able to translate between hundreds of different languages and give you a genuinely workable translation of virtually any text almost instantly. Um, and that, that's really a, a major shift from, from before when you would have had to hire someone for even, even the smallest amount of text. You would have had to go out and hire someone to, to translate that text. Um, deep learning is what is making self-driving cars possible. Um, companies like Tesla utilize this technology in order to, to build their technology. Um, it's what makes possible Amazon Alexa, where we're beginning to see the possibility to have at least rudimentary conversations uh, with machines like, like the Amazon Echo. So all of these things that we're seeing explode around us are really being driven by this single very powerful technology. And this revolution was really brought about by a few things that have happened, especially starting around the year 2012. That was the real inflection point. The first thing that happened 
is that computers simply got dramatically faster. You know, as, of, as a result of the accumulated impact of Moore's law, computers finally got to the point where it was, a, it was feasible to leverage this neural network technology in a way that would produce practical results. Uh, but the second, and maybe the most important thing, is that we now have available to us just enormous, incomprehensible amounts of data. And all of this data, which is now available, um, is really becoming kind of the feedstock to these smart algorithms. And it's the algorithms running on the fast computers together with uh, all of this massive amounts of data that is finally producing these ma major breakthroughs. Uh, deep learning has also kind of revolutionized uh, the hardware industry. We've seen um, in particular the growth of, of companies like NVIDIA, which you know, started out as, as building um, chips used in graphic processors, but it was discovered that these chips were also extremely useful in, in making deep learning uh, applications faster. And so we've seen just an explosion in the hardware side of things in terms of the design of chips that are specifically um, designed to accelerate deep learning applications. And that's also been one of the most, most important drivers of the progress that we've seen. So we already see these amazing things all around us primarily as the result of these recent uh, breakthroughs in deep learning. But it's also very clear that we are really only in the infancy of, of this revolution. Um, and you can see that I think most, most aptly by comparing the, the, the capabilities of many of these systems to the ultimate objective, which is you know, to build a, an AI system which comes much closer to um, stimulating what the whole human brain can do. You look at the kinds of problems that human beings are able to solve and compare that to what deep learning can do. And it's obvious that we have a long, long way to go. Uh, but that is nonetheless a, a very important research in this initiative. There are many, many people working on how can we take these deep learning systems, which are primarily good at doing very, very narrow specific things. And how can we evolve those so that they become more, you know, more general in, in, in terms of their application and get closer and closer to what we would consider to be genuine um, human level intelligence, where you have the ability to reason like a human being, to have things like um, common sense, for example, to uh, transfer knowledge from one area to another area. These are all things that, that human beings are uniquely um, adept at doing. And these are all areas that are under, you know, very significant um, research, inter, you know, in, in terms of what's happening throughout the field. So uh, I think one of the most interesting chapters in, in Rule of the Robots is the chapter where I really break this down and talk about the different approaches being take, taken and the companies doing it and the individuals doing it and so forth. And that is in part uh, based on the interviews I did with some of the top people in the field. So to me, that was... Uh, probably the most interesting and enjoyable part of, of uh, writing Rule of the Robots. And I think that that is a truly fascinating subject, you know, how this field is gonna evolve and how soon we might eventually get to um, a true thinking machine, something that, that um, is gonna approach human level intelligence. But for the foreseeable future, um, this is a technology that is primarily gonna be highly specific and it's gonna be used to increasingly solve a range of practical problems. Uh, now, one of the most exciting, maybe the most exciting applications of artificial intelligence that I think has so far emerged has been the announcement of uh, a system called AlphaFold, which was created by the company DeepMind, which is a division of Alphabet, Google's parent, which is based in London. Now, DeepMind is the company you've probably heard of that they created um, for example, AlphaGo, which the, which the system that was able to prevail at the, at the, uh, the game of Go. And you'll remember that back in 2016, uh, AlphaGo was able to defeat the best Go player in the world. And since then, they've, they've released a number of other game playing systems like AlphaZero that was able to prevail not only at Go, but also at chess and, and at other games. So they've been, you know, extraordinarily adapt to utilize, at utilizing the, the uh, deep learning and, and the techniques at the very frontier of the field to win, you know, to beat basically any human competitor at these games. But 
what AlphaFold represents is, I think, really the first time where this technology has been purposed into something that is really real, where it is really being leveraged, not to win a game, but to make a revolution, which is going to have uh, an impact in science. So what AlphaFold is all about is about discovering the three-dimensional structure or, or um, shape of protein molecules. Now, protein molecules are fabricated in our cells, and we understand in, in a fairly straightforward way how they're put together. Protein molecules are basically a chain of smaller molecules called amino acids. And this sequence that makes up this chain is determined by the DNA in our cells. And that's all fairly straightforward. But what happens is that when these chains are constructed, when the amino acids are put together in the cell, within a tiny fraction of this of, of second after this molecule, sometimes huge molecule is fabricated, it automatically folds up into a very complex shape. And you see one example of that on the slide here. Now, it is that shape that actually determines the function, the chemical function of the molecule um, within our cells. And it's also what determines, for example, how these molecules interact with drugs and so forth. I mean, protein molecules are incredibly important. They are really the fabric of life. They make up the structures in our bodies, you know, muscles and so forth. But also just as importantly, they are the molecules that perform functions within um, our body. So all enzymes, for example, are, are proteins. So to understand the shape of these molecules is, is just of enormous importance. And yet it has been very, very difficult to solve this problem, to figure out how do you get from a sequence of amino acids to a specific shape? And there are some very expensive and time-consuming laboratory techniques that can do this, but um, scientists for 50 years have tried to figure out how to, to analyze the genetic sequence um, or the sequence of amino acids and figure out the shape. And, and um, after a 50-year quest, AlphaFold essentially was able to solve that problem. We now have a system that can do that very easily. And as a result of that, um, DeepMind is making a catalog of all of the proteins that are important to, you know, to the human body. And, and this is just going to be an enormously important resource in medicine, in biotechnology, and so forth. So this is just one example of how advances at the frontiers of artificial intelligence have led to a truly revolutionary breakthrough, something that is very likely to impact um, all of our lives in a relatively near future. Now, one of the areas that I've really focused on a lot is the potential impact of artificial intelligence and robotics on jobs and on the job market in general. Um, and a lot of this is centered on robots, which have really seen revolutionary advances over the last decade or so. What you see here is an illustration showing what the robots that are used in Amazon warehouses look like. Um, and as you can see, they look something like big hockey pucks. And what these robots do is that they essentially move around the warehouse at, at relatively high speeds and they carry shelves containing inventory. Now, before the advent of these robots, uh, a, a warehouse like the ones used at Amazon would have instead had rows and rows of these huge sh stationary shelves and the, and the workers would have run around between these shelves and they would have been doing one of two things. Either they would have been taking new inventory arriving in the warehouse and putting it into a specific place on the shelf or they would have been going to the shelf often climbing up high ladders and so forth in order to grab an item from the shelf in order to fulfill an order to send to a customer. Now, the advent of these robots have actually turned that around. And what happens is that instead of running around to all these shelves, the robots, or I'm sorry, the, the workers stand stationary in one place. And you see an example of this, this, this guy here. And it's the shelves that move around to the workers. And so you see this gentleman here reaching into a shelf and he's either placing an item or retrieving an item to fulfill an order. So this is really cut down on the wear and tear on workers who now get to stand in one place and automated the movement of um, the shelves. But the important thing to note is that these Amazon warehouses and other you know, warehouses from other companies have thousands and thousands of these robots, but they also still have thousands of workers. And the workers and the robots work together 
And the reason that we still have all these workers there is that they are doing the things that the robots cannot yet do. And primarily that involves things that involve dexterity, hand-eye coordination, visual perception. In other words, the ability to reach into a shelf and grab an item which could be any size and shape and weight and texture and so forth. This is something that up until now, robots have not been able to do, certainly not with the kind of proficiency that a human being can do it. But that is something that is rapidly changing. Um, and what you see on this slide are two robots from a company called Vicarious in, in Silicon Valley that is building machines that are beginning to take on the kind of visual perception, dexterity, ability to grasp and so forth, manipulate the environment that, that human beings have. Um, and this is a technology that's clearly getting better and better. There are major investments going into this. Um, Jeff Bezos is actually one of the investors in this particular company. And he said at a conference just a couple of years ago that he thought within about 10 years, uh, robots would reach the point where they would equal human dexterity in terms of their ability to grasp and manipulate objects. And what that means is that within about a decade, it seems almost certain that those Amazon warehouses are going to become a lot less labor intensive. A lot of those jobs are going to evaporate because the robots are going to be able to do most of the tasks that the workers are now doing. So um, this is something that's going to have a dramatic impact in employment over you know, roughly the next decade. And of course, it's not just going to be Amazon warehouses. It's going to be factories. It's going to be fast food restaurants, um, you know, commercial settings, uh, supermarkets, and so forth. You're beginning to see these much more dexterous and powerful robots um, that will appear all over the place. And this is going to have a dramatic impact on, on the kinds of jobs that are available going forward. Uh, but of course, this story is by no means going to be limited to just, uh, you know, robots doing manipulative or what we think of as uh, blue collar type work. There's also going to be a dramatic impact on white collar work. If you've got the kind of job where you're sitting in front of a computer, manipulating information in some relatively routine way, um, that in many ways is going to be even more susceptible to automation than, than many blue collar jobs would be. And the reason is that white collar jobs that are predictable and repetitive um, and relatively routine in nature are even easier to automate than blue collar jobs are, because of course you don't need a an expensive mechanical robot and, and, and machine vision cameras to to have uh, you know, visual perception and so forth. It's really just software, machine learning, and the ability to, to automate these tasks. And we're already beginning to see that happening in areas like law, for example, where you've got smart algorithms that can uh, evaluate documents to see if they're relevant to um, a legal case um, that can, for example, analyze contracts um, that can do rudimentary uh, legal research and, and write briefs and so forth. You're seeing it in the field of journalism where you've already got smart systems that can look at some stream of data, figure out what is the interesting story within that data and then automatically generate a new story. And these are technologies that are getting better and better. So we are probably approaching a future where you know, any kind of work that involves sitting in front of a computer doing the same kind of thing again, 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 whether it's writing a report or doing the same kind of quantitative analysis um, um, or, you know, the same kind of presentation and so forth. All of this is going to be highly susceptible to automation. And this is going to have a very significant impact on jobs that are done by people that have you know, high degrees of education, college degrees, uh, maybe even graduate degrees. So again, this is definitely a big paradigm shift and a big disruption that is coming that we're going to have to figure out a way to deal with, I think, going forward. Beyond the potential impact on employment, there are many, many other risks that come along um, with artificial intelligence. There are many ethical issues that we're going to face. Um, I probably don't have time to go through all of these in detail. We can talk more um, maybe during the discussion, but just to give one example, um, the advent of deep fakes, or these are you know, essentially deep learning systems that are used 
to create fabricate fabrications, very high fidelity fabrications of of media could be photographs, video, audio um, that I think are going to be incredibly disruptive. In in uh, rule of the robots, in my the chapter where I deal with this, I give an example, a fictional example of a future presidential candidate, where some nefarious character creates a deep fake of this person, you know, saying something really horrible, perhaps something you know overtly racist, something like that, and you can imagine this audio clip appearing just a few days before the election. And it would be very, very high quality. It would, it would sound exactly like this candidate speaking. And maybe you could bring in experts to analyze this and eventually they would come to the conclusion that in fact, this is a fake, it's not real audio, but that might take a while. It might, if it, if it happened only a few days before an election, um, it could create you know, chaos. Um, it could actually, um, impact the outcome of an election. And uh, I mean, if you doubt this, in fact, deep fakes have already been used to steal millions of dollars from companies by creating audio, audio tracks of the CEO of the company, asking someone in the finance department to transfer money to some numbered account. And what they've done is they have actually, you know, set up a phone call where they leave a voicemail that's fabricated doing this and, and they've actually succeeded in, in um, tricking companies into transferring money. So this is one thing that's gonna be incredibly disruptive. Um, of course, many of you heard about the potential for alg algorithmic bias where, for example, you've got AI systems used in very high stakes scenarios, evaluating resumes to decide if someone should be bought in to, for an interview, um, even in the criminal justice system algorithms used by judges to decide if someone should be uh, released on bail, for example. Um, and we've seen cases where these algorithms have been biased on the basis of race or gender. So these are very, very important critical issues that the industry is very much aware of. Um, they raise real dangers um, as well as you know real ethical concerns. And this is something that um, you know, we're all going to have to be very open-eyed about as we um, embrace artificial intelligence going forward. But finally, what I want to just leave you with is the thought that although the risks, the dangers that come with AI are very real and something that we're going to have to be prepared to address, I think that the potential benefits from the technology overwhelmingly outweigh the risks. Um, I, in fact, I think that we simply cannot afford to leave artificial intelligence on the table. We can't afford to turn away from it because I think it's gonna be indispensable to us in terms of driving innovation and helping us to solve the problems that we're gonna face in the future. And I gave, you know, in some depth I talked about alpha folds being one very good example of that, but that's just one example. I think this is in a systemic way going to really drive innovation and creativity in many fields of endeavor, in science and medicine in particular. And that's gonna be of critical importance if we want to solve problems like climate change, for example. In order to, to you know, address climate change, in order to come up with um, clean energy sources and so forth that can, can help us um, solve this problem, we need innovation across the board in many, many different arenas. And I think artificial intelligence is gonna be one of the primary tools that that makes that happen. So it's absolutely um, a technology that I think is going to be of vast importance, maybe our most important tool in terms of um, increased innovation and progress in the future. So what we need to do is absolutely embrace it and leverage it on behalf of everyone, but to do that while being very much aware of um, the dangers and the risks that comes coupled with it. So I will end there and um, happy to answer questions. Thank you. Thank you, Martin, for such an uh, all in cut. You, you really covered the terrain extremely well because I think you gave us a good lay of the land. Perhaps you can stop sharing your slides so we can see each other. Uh, so folks in the audience, I'm just going to ask Martin a few questions and then we'll turn it over to you. And we already have uh, a bunch of open questions. So I'll get to you in just a few minutes. But first of all, thank you, Martin. That was, like I said, really sort of an interesting talk where you laid out both the potential and the risks of AI technology and how powerful it is. 
for me, one of the things that jumped out was actually the sort of the difference between the AlphaFold example and the robotics examples and the warehouses, because you know, one demands a huge level of cognitive skills and others are more about dexterity, and yet they still come back to the same sort of machine learning technology. But I want to start first with the impact on know-how because you said this, but I want to sort of make sure we make this point. Uh, you know, the cast competition, the protein folding problem has been around for 50 years. And here comes a, uh, an upstart company that's been around only for, has been competing for in two competitions, two years apart. Uh, and this is a field where the best researchers in the world from academia, from industry have worked on this problem and they weren't able to crack it. And here comes DeepMind and is able to do it. And, and so this is really sophisticated know-how that they're developing that people have been working on. So when I think about that, all I can think about is to your point about global warming or environmental concerns. There's so many complex domains out there uh, where we could use these technologies to sort of develop new knowledge that will make the world better off. So your thoughts on other domains where deep learning has a big role to play? Well, I think every area of science and medicine is going to be, um, you know, enormously important. I mean, AlphaFold is, is just one example, but uh, already there are, I think, a dozen or more startup companies that are using deep learning in drug discovery. Yes. In other words, discovering new new drugs. Um, so it's going to be extraordinarily powerful. I mean, the way drugs were discovered previously is, is a very laborious trial and error process, right? Where scientists would, would have to try different compounds and, and perform experiments, all of which take time. And, and they might be able to try, you know, at most a dozen at a time or something. Right. But now you've got these deep learning based systems that will go through thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands, millions of different chemical compounds, you know, examining the, in the potential interactions with, with proteins in our bodies and discover the ones that um, are likely to be, um, you know, most productive. And it's not just about drug discovery. It's, it's, it's general materials. You're doing, you, you're seeing the same kind of process in material science. Like in other words, to discover new materials that might be used in, in uh, better batteries or new materials that could uh, be used in stronger construction materials and so forth. So, so across really science and technology, this is just gonna become, I think, an enormously important tool and resource. No, I would agree with that. You know, I spoke to the chief digital officer in Moderna, the one of the manufacturers of the mRNA vaccines, and he was sharing with me stories of how they're using machine learning and quality control and the production of these vaccines, something I have to confess I haven't given uh, much thought to. I, uh, I want to take you back to where you started, though, and you talked a little bit about, uh, and I love the matter. By the way, everybody, this is going to be a short overview of the depth of Martin's book. So I urge you to read the book. It, it, there's so much more there, but let's try and do our best. You know, use this metaphor of electricity of intelligence and you talk about, you know, one of the beauties of it is that it's scalable, but it's also disruptive. Um, but the one thing I was thinking about is, so you've got these generic tools uh, that are getting more and more powerful. There's computing improvement that you pointed to. There's uh, clearly algorithmic improvement that is important. And then of course, companies are generating, you know, huge amounts of data. Uh, but you, what's the role of domain expertise in this? Because you know you can use Azure machine learning as I do in my class with a variety of different problems. But uh, how do you take these democratized tools and apply them to all of these different domains? What does the company need to do, and what does the company need to be good at uh, to sort of launch and scale their own innovations? Well, I think uh, clearly, you know, companies should be building. AI expertise, but it is true. I think that, that as the tools get better, it won't be so important to you know, employ people that have got PhDs in computer science because the tools are gonna to get easier and easier to use. And that means that the, you know, what you call the, the domain um, expertise is maybe gonna shift a bit. It's gonna, you know, it's, it's gonna become less important to understand the absolute rudimentary details of artificial intelligence are much more important to understand the domain where you want to apply it. And, um, and especially the kind of data that's available in that domain and then be able to use these tools in order in, in a very practical way. So I, I think it's going to 
you know, shift the expertise away from the, the nuts and bolts of AI toward, um, you know, a, a, an understanding of, of the particular areas. And of course that will be different for each company. And in a, you know, a healthcare company, it will be really important to understand the kind of data that that company has so that you can leverage the tools um, to get the most important benefit and so forth. Yeah, the other big story of today was, uh, you know, GM's division Cruise launched its first publicly available, it's, it's been available to employees for the last month, give or take. And as of today, if you're friends and family of employees, you can get, uh, they're not allowed to charge for it, by the way. So if you're up in San Francisco, find a connection and get, get a free ride on a GM Cruise, in a GM Cruise robo taxi. But there was a lot of videos doing the rounds on the YouTube today. And what it was interesting was, you know, within 30 seconds to a minute, everybody says this is a ho-hum experience, which is sort of what you want um, uh, in your self-driving car. But that's another application of deep learning. So, you know, a few years ago, we were not sure when this technology was going to be ready for prime time. I'm not sure it's ready for prime time, but it's certainly ready for something right before prime time. Uh, how do you see sort of the, this is, uh, the race for two, two self-driving cars between the GMs, the Teslas, the you know, the cruise the GM is cruise, of course, uh, all the competitors who are in this space, Waymo, for example, you know, Alphabet's division. Right. I mean, self-driving cars are, are are really a fascinating area, and it's one area where we have to say, in all honesty, that that, that AI has underperformed what the early expectations were. I mean, but way back in 2015, when I wrote Rise of the Robots. People were saying it was just going to be, you know, a, a couple of years before we had full self-driving cars. Um, and I think what we found is that driving a car in unpredictable um, circumstances on a public road is an extraordinarily difficult task. And I think that that in many ways it it really requires something much closer to human level intelligence than what we might have thought initially. It's really not just a rote repetitive routine thing because of the level of, of unpredictability. Um, so I do think that, that you know, if, if you're really imagining a full self-driving car that is going to do everything that an Uber can do, literally can pick you up anywhere and take you anywhere, right? I still think that's quite a ways off. I think that you're going to see these very confined experiments, like the most famous one is, is Waymo in Arizona, where it's, you know, it's, it's a, um, a, a suburb of Phoenix where, you know, the roads are very straight and wide and there aren't a lot of pedestrians and, and so forth and, and, and it's working, but um, to go from that to, to just anywhere is going to be a long haul. Um, but the two approaches that are really fascinating are, are what companies like Waymo doing, which is a very cautious, incremental approach focused on building systems that are level four self-driving systems. And then in contrast to that, what Tesla has been doing, which is just putting cars on the road with what is currently a, a level two system, in other words, an assistive system, and then promising people who pay a lot of money, I think, I think it's something like $10,000 right. oh, yes. uh, now, that at some point in the future, they are actually going to be able to download and update, and, and their level two system is going to become a level four system. Um, and that is an extraordinarily ambitious prog um, promise. I think that um, probably Elon Musk deserves a fair amount of criticism for promising that to, to his customers, because I think that coming with that is, is a fair amount of risk. Um, you, you, he, what, what Tesla is doing is literally having its customers beta test you know, unproven software that has, that it has at least labeled or branded full self driving when it clearly is not yet. Um, and that, that really is something that can put, I think, lives at risk. So it's, it's a very, very ambitious, I think pushing the very edge of what you could even say is ethically acceptable, I would say. Um, but it is also a remarkable um, effort to do that. And one thing I would say is that, that between these two approaches, you know, Tesla does have one very critical advantage and that is that they have got hundreds of thousands of real cars being driven on roads. And they've got this, this self-driving system, which is often enabled. And all of these cars are equipped with cameras. And that produces just enormous amounts of data, which 
Tesla then has access to. So Tesla has access to vastly more real world data coming from real cars on the road than Waymo does. Um, and you know, in the field of artificial intelligence, access to real data is incredibly important. So this is you know, definitely a competitive advantage that they have, and we'll have to see in the race between these two approaches, um, you know, who ultimately gets there first. You know, it's sort of really interesting because even though we talk about AI as a thing, which it sort of is, it's a technology and it applies to self-driving. I think what I would like to leave the audience with is there's still many choices that managers and executives need to make. So the example that you just gave, do you want to start with level two and work your way up to level four and five? Or do you want to start at level five because you believe that, you know, every time a computer passes control to a human, you're asking for trouble, which is sort of, uh, I certainly hold that concern because there's a lot of research that supports you know, in human computer interaction where pilots of ships, for example, uh, have failed because the, the computer flashes a warning at them and they're not sure what to do in real time. Let me, let me turn it over to the audience and uh, I, I'm going to read out the questions to you. Uh, so there's several questions, one from Jan Van Hammersveld. Jan, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Uh, but the question is, you know, the, you've got, and we know this, there's a lot of complex models with predictions that are out there. Uh, are there projects in process to examine training models and explaining them? So this is the whole question about explainable AI in certain areas, it's certainly far more important than others. What do you see happening as this, sort of the state of practice today? Right, um, this is definitely a, a very important area. And the problem here, just to summarize it, is that Neural networks are to a certain extent like black boxes. I mean, it's like, uh, you know, you literally have something that at a very rudimentary level is simulating the way the neurons in your brain work. And we don't, of course, understand uh, how the brain works. And in a similar way, we don't fully understand what's happening in these artificial neural networks. It's, it's really a distributed kind of learning. Um, but there is a, a lot of initiative uh, being put into making these networks more transparent and explainable. And in some areas, in, you know, in some applications, that's important and in others that might not be. If you are, you know, if, you, if you're using a neural network to op optimize the operation of an industrial machine, then you don't really care, right, about, right. about uh, what's happening. You just want the optimal answer. But when you are utilizing a neural network to give a, a criminal judge um, a recommendation about whether someone should be put in jail right away or whether they should be released. Um, it's, it's critically important to understand exactly how is that decision arrived at, what are the parameters, and in particular, are we doing this in a way that is, is you know, not biased um, racially or based on gender or something. And same thing when you're using AI to screen resumes. Um, you know, we need to understand exactly what's happening there. Are we being fair? Are we being, you know, is, is it a just outcome? And so, you know, the, all of the AI companies, the researchers are very much aware of this. And there are a lot of in initiatives right now into making these systems more transparent and also into the related area of AI fairness. You know, how do you build systems that in fact are not biased? So, so, um, it's what I would say is that the, the people working in the field are very much in tune with this and are putting a lot of effort into solving these problems, although it's not always easy. Here's a lighthearted question for the day after all this heavy topics we've been covering. Are there some fun and free ways to experiment with this technology? I, I'm sorry, I said again. Are there some fun and free ways to experiment with this technology? Well, yeah, you can download. I, I mean, I talked about deep fakes, for example. Um, you can get software to make your own deep fakes. And you've seen, if you go online, you can see some kind of joke applications of these. Um, there's a very famous one um, where you've got uh, President Barack Obama saying you know, things that he, he certainly wouldn't say. You can find deep fakes of uh, Mark Zuckerberg saying things that, that he might be thinking, but would certainly never say. Um, so you can have a lot of, uh, fun with that. Um, and of course, AI is being incorporated increasingly into video games. It's, you know, actually uh, sophisticated video games are one of the, the hotspots where you're really, you know, beginning to see AI applied, um, where you've got, you know, characters in games that, that rather than human players or AI based players and so forth. So there's lots of areas where you can experiment with this, either with actually developing it or 
or utilizing it. Yeah, there's plenty of cloud solutions that I'm not sure that they're free or not, but they're relatively inexpensive if you want, you know, from Amazon, Microsoft, whomever, there's plenty of those too. Um, there's an interesting question again from Jan, which is, um, I'm going to try and shorten it. Um, a lot of the chain, the, from, from Jan's perspective, a lot of the sort of applications of technology around robot, self-driving trucks, robotics, fry cooks, whatever, are really going to hit the low end of the market, the low end of the, the lowest wage end of the market, of the, of the labor market pretty hard. Um, based on these threats, what can we do as technologists, and I'm quoting, to ensure the weavers don't burn the looms? As technologists, it seems we have a responsibility to focus on assistive and augmenting technology when addressing low wage jobs. What, what do you, yeah. Yeah, I mean, eventually I think this could all reach the point where we need to really take a hard look at the nature of our social contract and, and really um, you know, revise that. That was the main theme of my earlier book, Rise of the Robots, where I really looked at this and, and my proposal in that book, which I still essentially believe is that someday we'll need something along the lines of a universal basic income. We'll probably have to supplement incomes for most or maybe all you know people and, and again it's not just going to be the low end blue collar workers i mean this is as i as i pointed out it's going to absolutely have an impact on white collar work as well yeah and and i think you can argue that it may well already being have an imp impact at the entry level at the more routine repetitive um types of white collar work that that recent college graduates for example are likely to take. And that's one of the reasons that if you look at college graduates over you know, the last few years, a lot of them are in, end up in positions that don't really require a college degree, right? They're working yeah. at Starbucks or, or something similar. So this is a very real problem for us. And I think that, um, you know, absolutely we need to invest in training. I think community colleges so people can, you know, transition into areas that are less impacted by automation. In other words, things that are less routine and repetitive more creative, um, um, harder to automate, um, maybe involving um, relationship building with people and so forth. These are the areas that are probably relatively safe, but eventually it may be such a big problem that we need to do something more dramatic, I think. There's a question from Aaron Thomas, which is exactly on the lines you were talking about. I would think there will, we will still need people to manage the robots. What sorts of skills and academic programs should young people consider to prepare for that? Well, in terms of if you're going to, if you're in a university, I think um, the main things I would emphasize are number one, creativity, um, and to, you know, try to enter a field where you're doing something, thinking outside the box, building something new, right? Um, because if you're a scientist and you're working in, in um, biomedicine, then a tool like uh, AlphaFold, for example, is not gonna replace you Rather, it's going to enormously enhance your ability to innovate, right? So it's going to complement you. Um, the, you know, the people really at risk are those people sitting in front of a computer doing the same things again and again. So you don't want to prepare yourself for that. So creativity is, is one area. Uh, another area is the kinds of jobs where you're really building sophisticated relationships with other people. Um, think of a nurse where you're working with patients and you have to have a high degree of empathy um, or a business consultant where you really have to have a deep understanding of, of a client in order to solve those problems. And I think it'll be a long time before machines can really you know, build meaningful relationships with people. I mean, you do see rudimentary progress in that area. There are already, for example, chatbots that do very basic mental health counseling, mm -hmm. you know, help people with depression and so forth. And this is you know, a positive um, development, but I think if you're building really complex relationships, that that's going to be a relatively safe area for the. Though I, though I do have to say that there were people actually working on their dissertation in the protein folding area that had to find a new thesis topic after uh, DeepMind solved some of the things they were working on. So they actually had to shift their entire research trajectory, which could be a good couple of years wasted. But I think the broader point, I would completely agree with 100%. What work is being done to use? So you know, this is sort of the, the 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 two sides using AI. So AI is being used to create deep 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 fakes. And the question from Don McRae is, what work in AI? What work is using AI to detect 
and combat deep fakes. Right, there are, I mean, this is a, um, it's a very challenging problem. Uh, the, the guy that actually uh, invented what are called adversarial um, generative next networks, which are what are used generally to create defects, his, his name is Ian Goodfellow. And um, you know, he has said that he thinks that probably there may not really be a technological solution to this problem, that, that eventually we may have to accept the fact that the, the things we see, the media we see, it may not actually be possible to determine whether it's real or whether it's fabricated. And that obviously that's a whole kind of worms. I mean, imagine the, the implications of that for the legal system where a jury might be presented with a video and you cannot say categorically, is it real or is it not? Um, you know, so, so that's, that's a real problem. I mean, there are initiatives underway, uh, things like, like, you know, digital watermarks. Yeah. There's one company that, that is doing this with photographs already that are used uh, by the insurance industry. So, so suppose you want to insure some jewelry or something. One thing you might do is take a photograph of it, right? And then you would send it to this company and take out a policy to insure you know, whatever you took a photo of, but of course the company has to be sure that that's a real photograph okay, and that this right. thing actually exists, right? So this is already happening. Um, but the bottom line is that, you know, there, there may, there simply may not be a real solution. And, and at a minimum, there will always be kind of an arms race between the people using this technology for nefarious purposes and the people um, that are trying to build tools to defend, right? Very much like what we see with computer viruses, right? Mm -hmm. So that, that's, that's the future we're looking at. And folks, if you haven't looked at a deep fake, you rolled in, I mean, don't overdo this, but you should do some of it because I was presented with the deep fake actually by a good friend of mine who's a professor at MIT. He actually spoke at one of these events in Anuraal and they used the, the technologies to completely, to, he gave an entire speech on one of those, um, other people money type investment deals where they used his presence and they got his lips moving perfectly in sync with his words. The accent was completely wrong, but you had to know him to know that that wasn't his accent. Um, but it was completely convincing, convincing and he was selling, like I said, a scammy investment and apparently people gave money uh, and he was desperately trying to alert folks. So it, it is very, very uh, real, at least at a superficial level. I can see how people can get fooled by it. Right, um, but, and the thing is, it's going to get a lot better than it is yes. now. I mean, what we see right now is very rudimentary, but you know, the quality of these fabrications is going to get a lot better. I think at some point, it's going to be my avatar versus your avatar. I guess is where we're going to end up with this. Um, in a provocative question from Justin Early: Over the past few years, some thinkers have concluded AI is good for things that require mere competence doing tasks. But you need humans for things that require comprehension, like synth synthesis, ethics, and so on. Do you think that distinction will hold for the next 10 or so years? For the next 10 or so years, I would say yes, because you know, in order to genuinely replace all the qualities that human beings bring to the table, you would need human level artificial intelligence, right? Right. Um, and that is something I believe will happen. I mean, in, in fact, you know, as I said, I, I interviewed um, many of the top people in the field and, and virtually all of them believe that someday we will have machines that match and very likely exceed human intelligence. And that would include the ability to think in all the ways that human, human beings think. Um, but very few people think it's only 10, 10 years away. I mean, there are some that, that are actually that aggressive. Ray, Ray Kurzweil, for example, thinks that. But I, I would not agree with that. I suspect this is probably a 50 year problem, something on on that order and many people think it could be even you know 100 years or more but sort of for the foreseeable future yes there absolutely is going to be a role for people um, to bring the kind of holistic general purpose thinking that machines are not capable of as well as um, ethical insights and so forth for sure i'm going to combine two questions by uh, jody giles and sam king one is can you comment on the aspect of understanding algorithmic bias and how to build trust in ai that's from sam and Jody's question is what regulatory initiatives are we seeing towards the AI risks you listed? So how do we address the challenges of risk through uh, building trust as well as through regulation? Because you probably need both. 
Right. Um, as I said, you know, there are many initiatives underway at, at, you know, companies like Google and Facebook and IBM are all making very significant investments in ways to counteract um, algorithmic bias. So one, one approach that, that is being taken that I think is, is very, very promises is the use of counterfactuals where um, anytime you, you apply one of these algorithms, what you do is you swap you know, important parameters, things like race um, or gender and so forth. And you essentially reapply the analysis and you make sure that you come to the same outcome. So, so you're making sure that you're not you know, leveraging this, this sensitive parameter in a way that, that, you know, that makes a difference. So that's one approach being taken. And, and you know, there's a lot of work being done on this. Um, and I think that we will get better at it, but it, you know, it's not necessarily an easy problem. You know, it's, it's, it's actually can be quite difficult. Um, in terms of regulation, um, I think that that's something that, that for the most part still lies in the future. What we see with artificial intelligence is that some, some applications um, intersect with regulatory apparatus that is already there. So self-driving cars clearly mm -hmm. are going to come under the purview of the Department of Transportation, right? Um, medical applications of artificial intelligence are going to be regulated by the FDA. So to some extent, that's covered. But when we talk about bias and algorithms used by a company that's screening resumes or something, there is not actually some agency that, that is empowered to audit those algorithms and make sure that they're not biased. And actually, I think that that is something that we probably need in the future. So one of the recommendations I make in uh, Rule of the Robots is that we maybe need a new agency, something like the SEC or the FDA or or the Federal Aviation Administration that, that focuses specifically on the implications of artificial intelligence and especially covers the areas that are not covered by other agencies, because it, it clearly it is critically important that if you're going to use an algorithm to screen resumes, then we want to make sure that's not biased, right? There should be some sort of auditing of algorithms like that to make sure that they are in fact fair. Um, and that's even more true if we're going to apply algorithms in the criminal justice system, for example. So I, I think that that's something that we're likely to see kind of emerge in the coming years. So Martin, I have a favor to ask of you. We have so many questions. We usually end right on time. And if you have to go, of course, we will fully understand. But if you can give us five or seven more minutes. Sure, no, I'm, I'm happy to stick around. Sure. Oh, fantastic. So my colleague, Tanya Bradford, has an interesting question. There are... Uh, she thanks you for an inspiring talk. So many opportunities for AI and ML, and she loves the analogy about AI as a utility. Appreciate the awareness that the challenges, but uh, raise particularly ones related to equity. And the question is, as we continue to advance AI, how do we address some of the disruptions to talent pipelines? In other words, how do we get not only current workers, but also K through 12 students to begin considering the possibilities for their contributions in the future to the workplace? Right. I mean, this, this is a very important um, concern because artificial intelligence is going to become our most consequential technology in many ways. It's going to impact virtually everything. So, of course, it is important to make sure that the people that have the deepest understanding of the technology that are involved in developing it and, and, and setting the direction for it, I mean, they, they need to come from, you know, they need to come across from across society, right? From, from every community. Um, and again, I think that this is something that has really become an important focus. I mean, virtually every major tech company is making strong initiatives to you know, bring as many talented people as, as possible in from, from you know, marginalized communities, um, from you know, to get more women, more people of color and so forth. Um, the same is true of universities. Yeah. Again, it is not an easy problem because to be an artificial intelligence researcher, you need a very strong mathematical background yeah, sure. and so forth. You need a very strong interest in this topic and the pipeline of, of individuals um, is, you know, is, not, is not that strong. So a lot of this involves initiatives um, you know, and much earlier, right? And er, er, earlier in education in schools and stuff. And, and actually in, in Rule of the Robots, I talk about one very important initiative, which is undertaken by um, 
um, Fei Fei Li, who is a professor at Stanford and, and uh, is one of the, the main people who is really one of the main, the most important minds in artificial intelligence, but she's got a, 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 a specific program designed to bring young um, girls and, and people from underrepresented backgrounds at the high school level and get them involved in this, um, for example. So there are a lot of programs like that out there. So I do think that in the future, um, certainly the, the people working in AI are, are certainly gonna become more di diverse than they are now, but it remains you know, an important challenge. Now, in fact, at the center, we were gonna do a, some, a similar thing for homeless children in Orange County, uh, which there are a surprising number of. Unfortunately, the pandemic interfered. Uh, my student, Marlo Stone, uh, we sort of touched on this. How far away do you think self-driving cars are? Uh, and is a national 6G network a must for level five cars to be on the road? Well, I think um, certainly the, 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 the 5G technology is critical um, in terms of you know, the increased bandwidth and everything. Um, and that will be an enabler, not just of self-driving cars, but of basically intelligence that's distributed everywhere, right? In, in all kinds of machines and, and places and so forth. Um, but really the real problem with self-driving cars continues to be the AI, the ability to solve problems and to deal with unpredictable scenarios. And I think, you know, again, to, if you're really looking at that, that vision of a self-driving car that can literally be an automated Uber where the car comes, mm -hmm. you can get in it, you can tell it to go anywhere you want. I think that's probably at least 10 years away, that would be my guess. Um, but certainly before them, we're going to have more restricted use cases. And even there, there's options like, you know, you're getting the Ubers and the Lyfts with their own self-driving fleets, in which case they become like Hertz and Avis. Or you've got Tesla, which apparently is considering you and me, if we own Teslas, being able to rent out our Teslas because they are self-driving or will be fully self-driving at some point in the future. So it's an interesting business model question. John Mooney has a question. Uh, it begins by thanking you and all your work in this area. What are your views on the readiness of US businesses and leaders in particular to effectively adopt AI and realize its business value? Well, you know, there have been some surveys done by some of the consulting firms. I, I worked a little bit with um, uh, Deloitte on, on this. And, you know, I, I think there is overwhelming awareness among, you know, like the, the, the C-level executives about the importance of this technology. Um, and, and the importance of investing in it. There's also widespread, I think, to some extent, concern about the potential impact on jobs and the ethical issues that are gonna arise. So I, I do think that most executives, at least in, in larger organizations, are very much aware of this. I mean, obviously different companies are having different outcomes in terms of their success in, in, in adapting to this. So I think it's gonna be kind of a noisy, messy situation, but clearly we are, Moving forward aggressively, I think the United States is relatively well positioned in terms of, you know, relative to, to other countries in terms of being at the forefront of this. But again, the message here is that AI is becoming like electricity and you certainly would not run a business uh, and disconnect from the electrical grid, right? That would be the highest level of business malpractice to do that. And the same is gonna be true of AI. So, um, Clearly, we're going to move forward, and, and certainly those companies that are first movers are going to have a very important advantage. You know, for those who have seen Downton Abbey, there's funny stories about because electricity comes in and the telephone comes in in one of the seasons, and you've got sort of the workers who are willing to embrace telephony and sell telephone systems or install them that in a few short years go on to making a lot of money, but there's also the introduction of electricity, and they're actually worried about being electrocuted, and these are supposedly real-life uh, examples that they've woven into the stories. I want to switch to a question from Don Benkes, I think how you pronounce the last name. How do you see boards of directors engaging with management on AI and providing oversight? Because there's the executive decisions, but boards have sort of these governance responsibilities, right? Right. Um, that's not an issue I've thought a lot about, but I guess it's a general governance issue. I mean, the board of directors, um, as well as the top management, is going to have to come to understand that this is going to be, AI is going to be I think uh, it's such a critically important resource to many large companies in the future that you almost have to view it on the level of human resources, right? I mean, everyone understands that the people in the company are a critical resource 
um, the source of the success of the company. We, we invest enormous resources in the HR department and developing people um, to maximize that resource. But AI is going to become sort of a rising second resource that's going to yeah. have to be viewed in, in, a, in a somewhat similar way in the sense that it's going to require enormous investment of talent and resources in order to maximize the application of that resource. In other words, to make that that business competitive, because if you know if the board and the executive team fail to do that, that company is going to be destined to fall behind the competition. Yeah, I even really see it as a dichotomy here because you know I was in a meeting of technology executives last week, and you know you hear all of these stories about self driving and the big companies investing very heavily, and then you talk to mid cap companies, for example, and they're nowhere close to sort of launching. AI applicate some, I should say, not, you know, there's certainly some out there that are doing it, but so there is sort of, I think a real challenge in front of us, the talent is a huge uh, set of issues, but I, I think even working with cloud solutions like the Amazons and the Microsofts and the Googles make available requires a level of competence that uh, I think we at universities need to work on providing to the companies that employ our students, I'm going to close, you know, we've kept you long enough, so I, I don't want to hold you here forever. You've been very generous with your time, but I want to ask you one last question, sort of fun. So we've talked about all the work impacts. I want to switch, there's a lot of questions here, so I'm grouping them on sort of the creative aspects of it. So what happens to music composers, artists? And then there was a separate set of questions on, uh, does AI have any, can it, can it sort of infer taste and smell and things like that? So things that are not, things that business folks usually, I mean, of course we do it as individuals, as humans, but not necessarily as part of a job unless you're a perfumist or something like that. Right, um, so the impact on, on what we would think of as creative, uniquely human endeavors is something that you know, kind of remains to be seen. There already are AI systems that can write symphonies. Mm -hmm. um, there are AI systems that can do original paintings, you know, works of art. Um, and you can, you know, if you can look at one of these works or, or listen to it and, you know, not be told that it was created by a, a machine and not a human being and, and in, in some cases react to it, have a emotional, an emotional reaction yep. to it, connect with it, perhaps be moved by it. So, I mean, there's a basic question is there is that, does that constitute art? I mean, is art something that by definition can only be created by a human being? Or if art is created by a machine, but it connects with a human being and, and moves you in some way, has an influence on you, then is that legitimate, right? So there are real questions there. Um, my, get, my, my feeling is that for the foreseeable future, um, although there is certainly a lot of research and innovation in the area of, of creative machines that, that uh, you know, if artificial intelligence is going to be a complement to human creativity, it's going to be something that amplifies create creativity. And already, in fact, you see visual art artists working, um, you know, with, with, with the kind of technology used in deep fakes to, to rather than creating fake things to create new um, things, you know, new, new forms of art and so forth. So I think it, it will actually amplify our creativity, but there definitely is um, kind of a blurry line between what is human and what is machine, and that may have real implications for the future. Um, I think it's going to be a fascinating um, journey there. Yeah, and absolutely, I'm go sorry. Ahead. It, go ahead. I, I'm sorry. Go ahead. And, and the other question about smell and taste and things that, you know, that's a question of building sensors that can do this. And, and there absolutely are, um, initiatives in that area, you know, specifically in things of detecting drugs, you know, or, or, you know, doing, you know, we don't have anything that is as good as a dog, right? Um, in terms of um, detecting, you know, smell yeah. and so forth, but there are initiatives in that way, not just vision, but smell, touch, all of that is going to be very important to the future of robotics. So it's, it's not just about AI per se, it's also about the sensors and how they can be tied into neural networks that can interpret that data and, and in many cases create real human sensation. So absolutely lots of progress there. Let, let me bring it back up to a high level. Let me, let me close with, with this because I love the last few pages of your book where you talk about sort of what happens in the future, that you're, you're a cautious optimist, my phrase, not yours. 
Um, so obviously there's a lot of potential, there's a lot of peril. Uh, what do we have to do, you know, just a few things that sort of increase the probability that we will achieve more of the promise and less of the peril? Are there any obvious steps that we as responsible executives or academics should be doing in our companies or teaching our students? Yeah, I mean, I think we need to, first of all, address the risks that come with AI. When we've talked a lot about, you know, the potential for bias and the potential for increased economic inequality as jobs are automated, if we can, you know, that's the one that I probably worry about more than anything. We really need to find solutions to that. And it may involve coming up with a new social contract. If we yeah. don't, we're going to, I think by default, if we just do nothing, end up in a world that is even more unequal than it is already. And we already know that inequality is a problem, right? It's gonna get even worse and worse. And you know, in, in those last few pages of the book that you refer to, I talk about two potential outcomes. The most optimistic scenario is something like Star Trek, right? Where you've got this, this world of abundance where technology solves our problems, where human beings are released from the need to, to have a job that's just drudgery where they walk all day at some mundane task in order to earn an income and survive. You know, people in Star Trek don't have to do that, right? They're, they're, they're living in a universe of material abundance and they're doing things that excite them. So that's the most optimistic path that I hope we can come as close to as possible. But a much more pessimistic take I say in, in the book is something a bit more like the Matrix movie, right? Where um, not, not that machines would enslave us, but rather that maybe the real world becomes so unequal. People feel that in the real world, they have so little chance to really get ahead and to thrive that instead they begin to escape into this virtual world where, you know, we see this combination of virtual reality and artificial intelligence creating an alternative where you can just plug in essentially um, sit at home and, and have some virtual vicarious experience without engaging in the real world um, and essentially check out. And you might see more and more people kind of fall into that, whether it's virtual reality or maybe it's other things like drug addiction, where you simply are, are divorced from the real world. And, and I think that's extraordinarily dystopian. Um, so if we want to get closer to that, Star Trek scenario where people are, remain engaged in the real world and they're thriving and, and seeing opportunity and seeing a meaningful existence, whether they're working in traditional jobs or not, we've got to do a lot of thinking about how to adapt to these changes and how to really leverage this technology in positive ways on behalf of everyone, instead of ending up in a world where you know, AI is positive for a very small number of wealthy people and everyone else kind of gets uh, left behind. Well, thank you so much, Martin. We've been talking with Martin Ford, the author of Rise of the Robots. I hope you can see the book. I'm sorry, The Rule of the Robots, Rise of the Robots was his previous book. Um, it's an excellent read. Um, thank you again for sharing your thoughts with us and for the wonderful, en wonderfully engaging conversation that we just had, really appreciate it. And let me not forget to thank our audience for attending. We really sort of appreciate the support you've shown us over the number of the, the 10 years coming on that we've been in existence. And finally, I, want, I do want to acknowledge our sponsors one, once again, uh, KPMG and Kalpana Ramakrishnan and the Beal Family Foundation and Don and Ken Beal. Thank you to all of you for attending. Thank you to our sponsors. And most of all, uh, thank you to Martin and my staff for helping us host these events. Uh, good luck with the rest, with your- Thank you with, for having With me. the book and good luck with your next project, whatever it might be. Again, thank you for joining us.